Good morning and welcome to the White House. I'm Tanya Bradshaw, the Associate Director for Veterans, Wounded Warriors, and Military Families. Thank you so much for braving this late snow in the spring and coming to today's event. Also, I wanted to remind everyone that we are live streamed on whitehouse.gov backslash live. And also you can follow our conversations on hashtag WHChamps or hashtag women vets. Today, I'd also like to quickly recognize Colonel Rich Morales, who is the Director of Joining Forces, here to represent the office. Rich, thank you. Last Tuesday, President Obama presided over the Medal of Honor ceremony for 24 veterans whose amazing acts of valor were finally recognized. I have to say, it was one of the most memorable moments I've ever had here at the White House. And <clears throat> the reason I bring up last week's ceremony is to highlight that today is also, also National Medal of Honor Day. In 1990, the United States Congress designated March 25th of each year as the National Medal of Honor, a day that is dedicated to all Medal of Honor recipients. It was on March 25th, 1863, when the first Medals of Honors were presented. So it's definitely an honor to have you all here today on such a historic day, so thank you very much. Today, we have 10 champs who were selected from approximately 400 nominations. As I call out your name, I would appreciate if you would stand and face towards the group. Erica Borgen. Mary Forbes. Sonia Kendrick. Dana Nimali. Dr. Stacy Young McCuggan. Martha Daniel, <laughs> Ellen Houlihan, <laughs> the Honorable Cora Wong Peach, <laughs> Graciela Tiscarino Sato. I was practicing in the back. <laughs> with all of us in the, with, with us today in the audience are also members of the Advisory Council on Women Veterans. This advisory committee assesses the needs of women veterans and with, with respect to VA programs such as compensation, rehabilitation, outreach, healthcare, et cetera. And we're so pleased they could be with us for today's event. In January 2014, in coordination with the White House Council on Women and Girls, VA kicked off a federal government-wide interagency women veterans working group. The working group exchanges ideas and provides for an engagement-centric conversation about agencies, women veteran programs, services, and initiatives. This group will, be, will, will really be a resourceful source to mine good ideas, leverage new approaches, and ways of addressing post-service issues that concern women veterans. Initiatives like this working group demonstrate the seriousness of our nation's commitment to women who defend our way of life. And now I would like to turn the event over to one such woman and our first moderator. The Honorable Gina Farisi assumed the position of Assist Assistant Secretary, Office of Human Resources and Administration at the Department of Veteran Affairs in September of 2013. Ms. Farisi directs and oversees HNRA team of over 750 employees who support more than 300,000 VA employees and 4,000 human resource professionals across the country. Previously, Ms. Farisi served as the Commanding General of the United States Army Human Resource Command, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Ms. Farisi has been awarded numerous military decorations to include the Distinguished Service Medal with two Oak Leaf Clusters, the Defense Superior Service Medal, and the Legion of Merit with two Oak Leaf cl Clusters. The Honorable Gina Farisi. At this time, if we could also have the first panel, please come up. What a great day to be a member of the VA team serving our nation's veterans, Hua. Good morning, and thank you for that kind introduction, Tanya. On behalf of Secretary Eric Shinseki, I would like to say congratulations to this year's Champions of Change. 
selected from hundreds of impressive nominations. You all are making a difference. I salute you for your incredible accomplishments and contributions to our nation's business, public, and community service sectors, and to the lives of veterans and service members. You all continue to be positive role models. I also want to welcome family and friends to this event. Thank you for making it here today. Our first panel, Erica, Mary, Sonia, Dana, and Stacy, all served veterans in some capacity. Their military service is heavy on the Army side, hua, with a little <laughs> bit of Navy mixed in. I want to personally thank you for your service. We will begin our panel discussion with each champion of change, taking a few minutes to tell us a little bit about themselves. This will be followed by a round of questions that each panel member will have the opportunity to respond to. I will ask the panel members to adhere to the time limits that have been discussed so that everyone does have an opportunity to speak. So without further ado, I will begin to ask the questions and we will start with Erica. How did your military service influence your career path? Wonderful. I'll start with that attempt at, at two minutes to summarize my life, perhaps. You can uh, have I grew three. Up in, you can have three. OK, thank you. I grew up in a suburban Chicago in a completely non-military family, and one day ended up getting a recruiting call from the tennis coach at West Point. Uh, and so as I like to say it now, I grew up on pink and ribbons and dance and somehow ended up marching off to West Point uh, with my mom crying, wondering what happened. Uh, and four years later, graduated from West Point after a, a tremendous uh, learning and growing experience. Uh, I graduated as the valedictorian of my class at West Point and headed off on a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, England, where I pursued a couple of different one-year master's degrees uh, and had my real college experience, as I like to say. Uh, and, and then from there, I, I went to Korea as an Army Medical Service Corps officer, where I had several assignments in the 18th Medical Command and deployed from there, as it turns out, to Baghdad to serve as General Petraeus's speechwriter as a member, really, of his small think tank internally in Iraq. Uh, I was with General Petraeus for a few years until I ended up being appointed by Governor Quinn after I left the uniform, uh, took that uniform off, and was appointed by Governor Quinn back in Illinois as the director of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, there we are privileged to do really tremendous work on behalf of nearly 800,000 veterans in Illinois. And one of the initiatives I'm most proud of is something called Illinois Joining Forces, which is our attempt to add a little bit of coherence to the sea of goodwill that all the veterans here in the room would recognize to create better crosstalk and collaboration among the many organizations that are out there serving veterans. And as for your first question, shall I jump right into that, General? Uh, no, we're going to allow just everybody to. Great. Yes, we're just going to do our intro. So, Mary? Oh, thank you. My name is Mary Forbes, and I grew up in a rural Pennsylvania in agricultural uh, situation, and I really uh, look at that as a great opportunity for learning such great worth ethics, and I thank my parents for that rich environment, and I, like Erica, ha got the great honor of being uh, selected for West Point and attending that for four years, and uh, the education and the training that I received there really is such a, a tremendous opportunity to really see the whole world and uh, explore all the options out there and get exposed to thoughts and ways of doing business that you never would have dreamed of. So uh, after that, obviously, active duty and uh, at then Fort Lewis, uh, the 9th Infantry Division, and had the opportunity to uh, at one time be in an all-male unit, which was at that time unheard of uh, as the military intelligence officer. Uh, but that was uh, hopefully... Uh, you know, an opportunity to really grow and learn with a group of uh, military men and mentoring, I think, was really important in those days for women because we really didn't have uh, very many women around. So we looked up to uh, those few that were there, but also to those men that helped us out. Uh, I, then I joined the Washington Army National Guard and, and was on active duty for with them for 26-some uh, years. Uh, and after that, was had the honor of being selected as the assistant director of the Washington Department of Veterans Affairs, serving veterans. And my main goal there was to help end homelessness uh, starting back in 2010. So the greatest thing that I'm really proud of is being able to put together uh, regional summits and really bringing that information to our local communities in our state so they could position themselves to go after grants and other types of dollars to uh, really uh, put a wraparound system around our veterans and their families. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, Anna. I'd have to say I have five children and I have two of them with me. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Sonia. Well, that's the most important job of all. Yes. Um, it's a hard to follow these ladies. Uh, my name is Sonia Kendrick and I'm a veteran of the war in Afghanistan. I'm from Iowa. Uh, I wear many hats. I'm a veteran 
farmer. I belong to the Veteran Farmer Coalition, and I'm also the founder of Feed Iowa First, and I'm an agronomist, which is an agricultural scientist, as well as getting my master's in sustainable food systems. Um, I, I found a great disconnect when I came back to my community to find in the heartland of America, we have over 400,000 people that go to bed hungry. And um, so I felt that uh, in my community, I could make a difference. And so I started growing vegetables for uh, food pantries. And, um, and what I found was that through my service to my community, I found that I uh, had a new purpose and a new way to serve my country. And I feel that with my work with Farmer Veteran Coalition, that um, we can help other veterans to find uh, a new purpose in their life by serving our country in, in the agricultural field. Okay, Dana. Good morning, my name is Dana Nimala. I actually was commissioned from the George Washington University right down the street here in 1997 in the United States Navy, so I'm pretty proud to be back in this neighborhood. I served as a supply officer in the Navy from 97 to 2005 where I served under the commander of the 6th Fleet in the Mediterranean and back here in Washington at the Pentagon for General Richard Myers when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. When I got out in 2005, my sole mission was to find myself and where I fit into the big bad world out there and I moved to Colorado where I had grown up and worked in the private sector for about five years. And I had a good job, I had a fun job, it was a cool job, but after a while it didn't have any meaning to me anymore. I didn't feel like I was serving a purpose in my community. And at the same time I was hearing stories of my friends coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, people I knew and people I didn't know who were becoming homeless and ending up in jail um, for things that seemed like they were so pre preventable. So I decided to quit my job with no real plan except to do something better. And in 2012, 2011, um, I became the program coordinator for the Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program for the city and county of Denver. I run a US Department of Labor program that helps homeless veterans reintegrate into the workforce. But what is so unique about our program and what Department of Labor has allowed us to do is to not just meet the goals of employment, which obviously are important, but, but, but to build the supportive network of services around the homeless veterans, that which they need. Um, it's not just about getting a job, but it's creating a community and that safety net for them. So through my work at the Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program, we built that network and got people connected to the resources that they needed. In 2012, I was appointed by Governor Hickenlooper to the Colorado Board of Veterans Affairs, where I serve as the committee chair for veterans in higher education. I was also a post 9-11 GI Bill recipient and used that to get my master's degree in social work. Um, I serve now as the executive secretary on the Colorado Board of Veterans Affairs. I'm the homeless coordinator for VFW Post One, uh, a post I'm very proud of that has done an exceptional job to outreach to women veterans and current generation of veterans and I'm the outreach coordinator for the Denver chapter of Team Red, White, and Blue and a volunteer for Team Rubicon as well, really bridging the gap um, across generations of veteran services. Okay, Stacy. Wow, so I'm Stacy Young McCuggan. I think I've changed my remarks about four times already <laughs> after this entire group, so I'm sure it might be a little discombobulated. So, um, I grew up in upstate New York and I came in the Army as an Army Nurse Corps officer right out of my uh, bachelor's program. I wanted to be the best nurse that I could be and I felt like the military would offer me an opportunity for to treat a lot of different patients across a lot of different settings and I absolutely got that opportunity. Um, I served in the Army for 29 years, uh, just retired in 2008. Uh, as I, I had primarily clinical jobs to start with and I got, I was very compelled by figuring out what the best evidence was for caring for patients with various diseases and compelled by uh, knowing the research and conducting my own research to help identify those best forms of treatment. So um, as a part of my military service, I, I never deployed. Uh, you feel a little bit like an imposter. How could you possibly be in 29 years and never deploy? But um, when the 
When I was young, I wasn't selected to go to war. And when I was old, I was too old and never could figure out how many <laughs> pairs of, of, bi of reading glasses one should take into, into combat. <laughs> I have, I've never seen that on any pack list for senior 06s who have poor eyesight to do that. But anyway, I, I felt like I tried to do my best for um, staying home and supporting our troops. I was the head of an institutional review board at that time, and we were able to set up a process to review research in theater. So we're conducting research far forward to once again figure out what the best ways are to care for our uh, active duty men and women who are putting themselves in harm's way and many times getting injured, we want to provide the best care possible for them. So I retired in 2008 and have had the incredible good fortune to join the faculty at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. There I work with a terrific group of people under the name of Strong Star. Uh, that's a research consortium focused on the study, um, the understanding, prevention, and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we were funded by the De Department of Defense in 2008, have conducted uh, 24 studies, recruited over 1,000 active duty service members uh, into uh, clinical trials in Central Texas and up at Fort Hood. Uh, just last September, we were funded to continue that work, so we're hoping to figure that out and give every one of our veterans returning with post-traumatic stress disorder an opportunity to be treated successfully, to return to a uh, you know, fully functional, integrated life um, that they, uh, they serve their country with for us. So I'm incredibly humbled to be here and happy to meet everybody. I don't think there's a question in anyone's mind about why these ladies have been selected as our champions of change. So a round of applause. <laughs> so now we will start with our first question, and we'll start with Erica. How did your military service influence your career path? So that's actually kind of a hard question to answer when my entire career from 17 onward has been either military or veterans. Uh, I think probably any of us who have served in uniform would say that there's something incredibly shaping about a military experience, and, and probably especially the case when you start that at age 17. Uh, for me, I mean, that at that age, you're really growing into yourself anyway. And so whether it was at West Point or whether it was you know, taking command in Korea, one of the things I found my military experience consistently did for me was throw me into environments that were tremendously uncomfortable and for which I felt not sure that I would thrive. Uh, and there's a sink or swim mentality in the military world that you really learn to thrive in the middle of. Uh, and you figure out you can dig deep, deeper than you thought. Uh, and, and end up swimming. And, and maybe it wasn't your natural strength in the beginning. There were a lot of times I, I felt like I was faking it in the beginning, especially company command, standing in front of the soldiers and acting way more confident than I felt like I was. Um, but I grew into it. And there was something about that growing into it and um, developing the skill set of being confident, developing that confidence that has really equipped me for my job now. Um, because I went directly, as I said, from the military world to the veteran world. I think there's also something about being a woman veteran uh, that equips you for that experience of being the only whatever it is in the room. In my case, it's the only person under the age of 40, maybe in the governor's cabinet, or the only woman in the room. You get used to that feeling in that same swinker, sink or swim environment, um, and, and it equips you. You think, I've been here, and I've done that. Um, and I've also had the privilege of seeing really large efforts at work, large staffs, um, huge missions, and you see how that works in the military environment. You almost wish a little, it worked a little more like that in the real world as well, whether that's in government or business, where you know exactly which element of your staff to use, how to delegate out, how to back plan, because you've seen it in some ways. You've done it. You've led, and you've, and you've done that. Um, and so even though I'd never led a 1,300-person agency before when, when I all of a sudden was the director at the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, I was really used to being uncomfortable, and I wanted to be uncomfortable. There's something growing about that stretching experience that's really equipped me. Great, thank you. Mary? Yes, thank you. Well, uh, what I think of is the last couple years of my uh, 
active duty uh, stint with the Washington Army National Guard, I had the pleasure of being in charge of all those things that we did bef before deployments and during deployments and after deployments. And that really got me in sync with what our veterans and their families were going through because as, as, as a guard member or reserve uh, member, you're constantly going from a deployment status back to real life and back and forth. And so that really got me uh, close with our Washington Department of Veterans Affairs. And I remember pretty clearly, it was probably 2004, and we, we didn't have any laws that supported guard and reserve, or we, we really didn't have any systems in place to, to help with this. And th then the director director uh, of our agency, of the state agency, and I was on active duty at the time, and he came to us and said, we really need to set something up for our veterans, and, and I said, oh, great, let's do a briefing, and he said, no, Mary, this needs to be customer service. We don't want to brief our veterans. We want to actually do a, a, a significant event that ensures that they're uh, uh, connected to their entitlements and ben benefits, and it was like this aha moment for me where, you know, we were so used to briefings that were output-oriented. All we measured was how many people we briefed and shifting that whole concept to outcome-based so that we know that they actually completed their claim or that they actually applied for their veterans' health and actually did it. So that began a process in 2004 where we worked with the State Department of Veterans Affairs, and that really set me up for this opportunity when I came to retirement and uh, the director asked me to come on to help to help find ways to end homelessness for veterans. And I think those skill sets that Erica talked about and, and, and the functionalities that are in such an organization as, as any one of our services, every single functional area is represented from research and, and um, medical to logistics and you know, being able to cook and serve and fuel and ammunition. And often you don't think of the, uh, the, the military services as a huge corporation with incredible structure that you learn then how to lead folks and how to use that staff to get the fullest out of everyone and to really be a team. So thank you. Thanks very much. Sonia. Thank you, Mary. Um, when I was a young person, I was in the military for 10 years, and when I was a young person, I really didn't like the military. <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, I, I didn't like the discipline, and I didn't like people telling me what to do. So when I got out um, and I experienced civilian life, uh, I was very frustrated with the civilians too. Uh, uh, <laughs> But what, the most important thing I learned from the military is that my opinion counts, um, and I have a voice. And I also learned from the military that when people work together, when they put on uniforms that don't identify them with a class, uh, that don't identify them with uh, a demographic, um, that when they become people, that the military is a, is a, a wonderful example on how humans when all those barriers are broken down, we can get things done. So um, I also learned how to not take no for an answer. Uh, but, and to pre persevere. I, I, uh, I can do amazing things. The military showed me that I can do amazing things. And so um, when I get up in the morning, uh, I know that anything is possible. Excellent. Dana. I think that one of the key elements I learned in supply school, uh, which was you don't have to know the answer, but you need to know where to find it. And that took the pressure off me of having to be the expert of absolutely everything. And couple that with the advice of Chief Warrant Officer Bob Struckman, who said to me, don't ever think that you know more than the people who work for you. And I was probably about 23 at the time, and I had no idea what he was telling me or how it would serve me or how I would be passing that information along. If there was one thing you ever learned when you were in the Navy, what was it? I'm like, well, Chief Warrant Officer Bob Struckman told me once, don't ever think that you know more than the people who work for you. And I think taking those, combining those two things really helped me learn how to build a team of experts around me and that my position was really to galvanize that team and to help set the vision and move the needle forward. And I think that that translated not only into what I'm doing now in building the network of services that we have helping veterans in Denver and in the state of Colorado, but also it helped me in the, on the civilian side, in the private sector. 
I, I knew how to get things done in the business that I was in and take on the expertise of everybody around me to meet the needs of the customers because even whether it's in the private sector, whether it's in government, a nonprofit organization, you have customers' needs. You need to listen to your customer, hear what they need. When I was in the military, it just so happened my customer was the number one general in all of the entire United States military. I certainly needed to know what his expectations were so I could deliver on that, but I couldn't do it alone. And I think that was the, that was the biggest takeaway from my military service that serves me not only in the private sector, but also in government, is that we can't do it alone. We build the network of experts around us and draw on everybody's individual strengths, whether it's as a person or as an organization, to really meet the objective and deliver the product to your customer. Great, Stacy. So I'm kind of feeling like we're all saying the same thing, uh, maybe in slightly different ways. So the way I would say it, you know, I'll take from Erica the um, importance of uh, trying to stretch yourself and being in uncomfortable um, positions. I always like to say that the Army always gave me what I wanted. They never gave it to me when I thought I wanted it, but <laughs> I eventually got it, and it worked out better. It worked out way better better for different reasons. I was in a better place, or the environment was ready, or I was ready to learn new things. It, it always worked out well, and so I, I appreciate that ability to adapt and change. And then I think what um, Mary and Sonia and Dana all said was the um, importance of leadership and the importance of appreciating your team. And um, it took me a long time to figure out I didn't want my team all people that look like me, because we would all drive ourselves crazy doing that. Um, but after you reach about the age of five, I think your personality is kind of set. And the trick for leaders is to figure out everybody's strengths and bring those together as a team to capitalize on everybody's strengths. And if somebody's not working well for you in your team, you haven't figured out what their strengths are. And um, if you do that, and I think you and your entire team and your project will only, only do better. So um, that's the way I would say the same things, or echo the same things these women have said, I think. Ladies, thank you. Thanks for taking me down memory lane, too. Standing there as that company commander. Okay, Stacy, I'm going to start with you for the second one. <laughs> what action could employers, service organizations, educational institutions take to make more women veterans successful? Okay, when your name starts with Young, you're used to going last. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go alphabetically backwards now. Mm -hmm. um, well, so this is, this is a really difficult question because I, I do believe that if you make the entire group better, then you make women better, you make minorities better, you make veterans better, you make everybody better. If you can give opportunities to the, the team to uh, excel and uh, be where they need to be. Um, if um, I was looking forward, I would like to see large organizations in this incredibly cost-constrained environment pick their top priorities and focus on those. And I see my uh, colleagues in, who are still on active duty and who are retired and still serving the military in lots of different ways suffer because we are continuing to put more and more and more on them with fewer and fewer resources. So I think if uh, as leaders we could figure out what the primary missions are and then uh, let our teams move forward to accomplish our primary missions, that uh, we would help women veterans and all groups uh, excel and succeed. Really good. I think that's a really loaded question that has a lot of complicated answers, but I'm a social worker, so of course I would say that. Um, <laughs> If you're doing your job to outreach to veterans based on the wonderful attributes all of these ladies have talked about, and if you're doing everything to outreach to women to include them in your organization, you're going to target women veterans because we encompass a whole lot of different aspects. Um, the bottom line is what needs to be encouraged is women in leadership, whether it's in your organization, your business, or your government. Women need to hold positions of leadership. And we're educated for it. We're outpacing men in getting advanced degrees. 
we, we have the qualifications to do the job, so the rest of it is more of a societal adaptation, if you will. Um, I wouldn't be sitting here today if it were not for male mentors in established organizations who recognized the value that I brought to their organization. Whether it was through the VFW, reaching out and making a concerted effort, yes, the VFW, making a concerted effort to outreach to the younger generation of veterans and women in particular in government, I was hired by a Vietnam veteran who saw that I had the energy and enthusiasm to move the needle forward, to take the next step in what had to happen. But that doesn't mean that I didn't hear along the way, sit down, young lady, you don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't mean that I haven't heard somebody say, complain about the feminization of their organization and in the same breath look to me to say you've done more for this organization with your passion and enthusiasm and getting us engaged in community service than everybody ever has. So that's not my problem, that's their problem. That's a growth issue on the organization and the individual level. And what I can say to that is we need more women who are willing to have the courage to stick it out this kind of change doesn't happen overnight. It takes tenacity. Um, and we need more women who are willing to stand in the face of that sit down young lady, you don't know what you're talking about, and no, yes I do, and in time you'll figure it out too. <laughs> I think a lot of employers are, and many civilians are, what's the word? They're a little intimidated by us. And what they need to know about us is that we are a valuable natural resource because um, we don't need to be babysat. Um, we show up to work on time. Um, we, we work hard, we solve problems, we're leaders. Um, we don't take no for answer, you know, we, 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 make, we, make a, we find a way to make it work. And so we, we need to be leaders. That's what the military taught us to be. They taught us how to be a leader. Um, and so um, when you put us into positions in companies, you should consider us for leadership positions because we won't disappoint. And the other thing that we need that the military uh, ground into us um, was that we need a mission. So if you give us a purpose and a mission, we will, we will complete that purpose and that mission because that's how we operate. Um, I don't know if I can speak. That's how I operate. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, when, when we have a life that has a mission and a purpose, then we, then we excel in those things. Thanks. Well, I'll answer this two ways. One, personally, uh, when veterans um, are on active duty and as they come off, they're really uh, dis disassociated or not connecting to higher managers and things happening in the real world. And so just making that friend and helping, if you know a veteran, whether they're male or woman, just helping them connect with what to wear. I mean, one of my biggest challenges was figuring out how to wear clothes and necklaces. I mean, don't you remember all those safety uh, things we went through? Do not wear necklaces or rings or you might be, you know, you know, hurt somehow. So, <laughs> so it was like getting over these hurdles that I, yes, I could, I could learn how to dress, right? And I would have uh, some great friends help me that were out there and knew how to do those things. But I guess the, the big way I look at things is as a system uh, that the way we have uh, the process now as folks are coming off active duty, we have what we call the VOW Act, which makes our transition process mandatory and, and starts a year out. And so with that process, and I know we've had a lot of discussions about that when General Pharisee was still on active duty, and she knows it's a passion of mine because I really feel that it's important that the servicemen or women start early thinking about what they're going to do and that there's ways and means for our uh, are companies out there that want to hire them to reach in and begin to help them understand what a hiring manager is looking for and understand what the civilian market means because you don't know how to interpret jobs. I mean, I've been out for four years and I still can't really read job announcements and comprehend how do I fit into that. So there has to be a two-way street and, and our military services now have a system that they've been working on putting together so that uh, I feel that the biggest thing is that 
outside companies meeting and greeting our active duty components and figuring how to get upstream to engage our veterans early. And uh, that includes our guard and reserve so that they can really uh, filter into your companies and organizations and uh, not only help them earn a great live, a wage living, but as everyone's been saying, uh, really uh, do amazing things in your organizations. So thank you. Stacey, I empathize going last because you almost want to respond to something every, everybody has said along the way. Um, if I had to say one maybe additional thing, it would, be, it would be to engage. Whether you're a citizen, an employer, a teacher in a classroom, whatever it is, uh, you mentioned that, that folks feel intimidated. And I, I think that's actually the case that out of respect, I've often discovered folks stop the conversation right after thanks for your service. Uh, that you don't, you, you don't want to say the wrong thing, you don't want to hit a tripwire, you have no idea how to engage that conversation because you don't maybe know very many veterans in your life, and, and so that's where the conversation ends, and I think it ends up being really very isolating for a lot of veterans, even though it's well-intentioned on the part of whoever stopped the conversation there. And so my encouragement, I think, to anybody in encountering a veteran you know well or not well is to just ask the natural follow-on question, uh, something along the lines of, well, what was that like? Uh, and let the veteran themselves determine how far they want to take that conversation. Every veteran has a different experience. Not every, not every veteran is, is uh, somebody who's had a traumatic experience. And I think that, uh, again, while intentioned in the media coverage of veterans, you often see uh, one view painted, and that's of the struggling veteran. And there are a lot of struggling veterans. There are a lot of veterans coping with, with their combat experiences, with post-traumatic stress, with homelessness. Um, but what we don't hear is the story of the veterans on the other side of that, or even the service that those veterans, as they're struggling, are putting in toward helping other folks. And I think if we focused on that narrative, we engaged our veterans, and we saw our service to them, our employment of them, our teaching of them in classrooms, not as something I owe them, uh, but instead as something I owe to my company or to, to my classroom, because there's tremendous value and experience that this person brings here. Uh, that's something we can do for an individual veteran, but really for all veterans to, to not let ourselves be overly defined. You've heard a tremendous diversity of experiences, I think, here today and, I, and, and strengths as well. Uh, and so if I had one last thing to say, it would be l take a swing. If there's not a particular fit for a company or for your classroom or whatever it is, um, give the benefit of the doubt because most of us have been thrown out there having not done it before and we've swum. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Eric, I'm going back over to you. What one word would you use to describe a value or principle that guides your life? Service. Do I get to expand or still one word? You have 12 seconds to expand. 12 seconds. Whatever I do from the time I was young until now, I want to make an impact. I want my life to, to be meaningful, and I think that happens through service, through having your everyday job uh, be something that you feel you're being impactful through. Mine's very similar. I, I, I selected selfless service because I feel that I'm always wanting to help someone, whether it's my family, my children, veterans, their families. I always want to find the solution to the puzzle because I always feel there's enough resources and uh, good things going on, but how do you connect that? So thank you. Um, I picked service too. <laughs> I believe that uh, a life served, a lifetime worth of serving people is a life that's worth living. And having almost lost my life multiple, multiple times, I know that um, the best thing in my life is to serve others. I'm not going to say service. <laughs> My, but you did think about it. I <laughs> thought about it. My answer is integrity. And the reason... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I believe in, in the words of Don Miguel Ruiz, be impeccable with your word. Do what you say you're going to do, whether it's in government, whether it's in the private sector, with it, if it's with your own family and your friends. Do what you say you're going to do and surround yourself with those who believe in that value as well. And that's when things really, really get done. Guess what mine is? <laughs> <laughs> so I picked integrity too. Um, doing the right thing to the best of your abilities, to the best of your knowledge, to the best of your energies every given day, every given moment, um, all, all the time. 
What an amazing group of ladies. I want to give this veteran team a very warm welcome. Thank you. And now I will welcome our second team to the podium. Lisa Bassnight will now take over. Oh, you come here. I'm sorry. I am taking over somebody's job. Always in charge, excuse me. That's okay, ma'am. We're used to it. I retired in September, so if you saw me being the bobblehead in the corner, as a lot of us were also doing the exact same thing. Um, while we're setting up the um, second panel, why don't you go ahead and come on up, and then I'll introduce our, our panelists, our uh, moderator for today. If you're a veteran, please stand. We'll give you a break. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you. So as we're setting up, I'd like to introduce the moderator for our second panel, Ms. Alyssa Bass Knight, whose career demonstrates a lifelong passion of serving others. Ms. Bass Knight was appointed Director of the Department of Veteran Affairs, Center for Women Veterans in October 2013, and is the primary advisor to the Secretary of Veteran Affairs on programs and issues related to women veterans. Prior to her appointment, Ms. Bass Knight served as a corporate commercial counsel in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, focusing on general corporate commercial contracts, small businesses, and women, veteran, and minority-owned businesses and technology. Ms. Bass Knight is the founder of Girls Action Network Incorporated, a nonprofit serving a nonprofit serving girls and young women, especially those from underserved communities with a particular focus on STEM fields. Ms. Bass Knight graduated from the U.S. Military Academy West Point and served overseas and in the United States as a military intelligence officer, including a Joint Chief Staff appointment. Ms. Bass Knight. Thank you, Tanya, for that very kind introduction. And good morning. What a morning, right? I mean, having yes. listened to this uh, first panel, and um, I just can't help but being motivated. It is just truly a treat to be here with all of you this morning. And um, if you didn't think it could get any better, well, you're in for a treat, because it is about to. And I am here to be able to introduce and facilitate a discussion with our champions right here who are leading in business, entrepreneurship, the law. But before I say anything else, um, as the director of the Center for Women Veterans, which serves our nation's 2.2 million women veterans, I just have to say one, a truly heartfelt thank you to all of our 10 champions and congratulations. I truly salute you. And for those accompanied by family, I know, um, we have someone who has five children and you have two here. Um, for all of the families, thank you. We appreciate you for your continued support of your champions. And thirdly, I know we had all of the veterans stand, but could I just see uh, by a raise of hands all of the women veterans? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for your service. Chills. Because in an homage to this year's Women's History Month National theme, which is celebrating women of character, courage, and commitment. We at VA salute our 2014 champions and the legacy of all of the women military leaders who embody these values, who make our country great. Through their brave actions, past and present, the officers, the enlisted of the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard. And these role models who also serve as our grandmothers, our mothers, our daughters, our wives, our sisters. When these women surrender their uniform, they keep the intangible with them. You've heard it already this morning, and you're about to hear some more wonderful experiences. The unbeatable skills that they use in corporate boardrooms or cross into the public sector, and still others transform themselves into enterprising entrepreneurs. The bottom line is that women were a force for good in uniform, and as veterans, women are a force and will be a force for breakthrough economic growth for our nation. And our job is to make sure that they have the services and support they need. So the purpose for this panel is to have our champions share a range of diverse perspectives, career, educational, and personal experiences through a moderated discussion. And my goal for this panel 
is that all of us will be incredibly enriched. We already have with the first portion. Um, and thinking about ideas and sharing information and how we are employing our women veterans, collaborating with women veteran-owned businesses, and engaging our women veterans in our community and public service activities. Now, to share their thoughts with you, I'd like to introduce you to five extraordinary women veterans who are doing extraordinary things in their respective sectors. So we have Martha Daniel, who's the president and CEO of Information and Management Resources, Inc. Ellen Houlihan, vice chair, the board of directors, West Point Association of Graduates. Cor Coral Wong Peach, judge, state of, of the State Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. And I must say, this is honorable. Coral Peach. <laughs> Deborah Scott Thomas, founder and president and chief executive officer of Data Solutions and Technology. And Graciela Tiscarano Sato, CEO and founder of Gracefully Global LLC. So without further ado, similar to the process that we followed for panel one, I'd like each of the champions to take a couple of minutes to introduce, and you do have three minutes, as, as we said, to introduce and share some highlights about your professional experiences. Graciela, I will start with you. Thank you so much. So I am one of five children born to Mexican immigrants, and I want to shout out to my mother and father, Arturo and Tina Tiscareño, who are watching right now from El Paso. Uh, I, was, I grew up in northern Colorado in a town where the largest employer was a meat packing plant. So um, I wanted to leave. I pretty was sure. I knew that I wanted to go to college, but as the oldest of five kids, there wasn't money f to do that. And I was, you know, that was pretty much clearly communicated as it is to a lot of today's uh, children of immigrants. But I had friends who had college educated parents and I was going to find a way. So all the problem solving that the military gives you, thank God I had a foundation of that. And so I had a counselor who mentored me, which is why I'm so big on mentoring now. Uh, her husband had been an Air Force officer and gone to school with an Air Force ROTC scholarship. So she said, come to my house for dinner. I think I have a solution. So it was my counselor's husband who told me about the Air Force ROTC scholarship that allowed me to go to Berkeley. And at Berkeley, I majored in uh, environmental design and architecture, and I also did my aerospace studies there as a scholarship cadet. Uh, loved the leadership opportunities, and my first airplane ride in my life, because we didn't travel on airplanes um, as a young kid, was in a T-37 tweet at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona with a female pilot named Captain Dolly DeLisa, who I still remember. It was a profoundly important moment because she said, yeah, you can go fly. I thought I was gonna go do civil engineering after getting my degree. So I put my name in for the board halfway through and I was indeed selected uh, to go fly, and so I went to undergraduate uh, navigator school after graduating from Berkeley. So my life, um, I have a presentation called The Unlikely Military Aviator because it pretty much sums up how I look back and go, that really happened? Uh, that's amazing. And so that, that experience really has led to why I have chosen now after a global marketing experience to start a multicultural publishing company that publishes bilingual books and multicultural books and green economy entrepreneurship case studies of Latinos and Latinas who are highly educated but you don't see in the media. And so we've also published the first bilingual children's book series about women in the military. Buenas noches, Capitan Mama, Good Night, Captain Mama is our first book. This has never been done before. And so I want my culture and I want women like me who are Latinas who have served, and I know a lot of us, to be represented in the literature so that more of our little girls can think about flying and think about serving. And so I've taken my military experiences and, and reflected on them and gone back now as a publisher. And I'm putting books in schools. Our team is very creative and we put the books in schools because we want those images to be present in our kids' minds because they were not visible in my education. And so that's what I've done. I've just gone directly to, wow, that was a miraculous experience that I've had in the military and 10 years of flying and traveling the world and four continents and being an officer and being a navigator and being an instructor. And uh, so that's what I do. I'm, I'm now putting it out there through literature so that more can follow. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah. Good morning. I am Deborah Scott Thomas, and as I listen to Graciela, I can't do anything but smile because I am the fifth of seven children. <laughs> However, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. And in coming up, I can say I'm the uh, daughter of Jim and Mary Duncan, 
At the age of eight, Jim Duncan became a heavenly angel in 1962, leaving seven children behind, two and a half to 15 and a half years old. I say that we were from the farm to arrive here in Washington, D.C. at this particular time. But in graduating from high school, I attended Alabama State, where I entered the ROTC program because I wanted to travel the world. Traveling the world, what it was, upon graduation, as I said, we were farmers. I became a hospital administrator, given three people to supervise a million dollar budget from the field to the office. So when it talks about leadership, that's what the military did for me. When it comes to being able to go places and do things and serve and transitioning to the reserve, I continued on in aeromedical evacuation. Aeromedical evacuation meant everything because we were able to travel CONUS and bring patients back and connect families, really getting the service members back into commission. It means so much because um, coming from the fields of Montgomery, Alabama in the 70s during the civil rights, it's showing women where they can be, showing the family how they can proceed, getting an education. My mother instilled two principles. Put God first and all things shall be given to you. Get a good education and you can go anywhere in the world. And also get that leadership skill from the military. I started Data Solutions and Technology. Data Solutions and Technology is a management consulting organization that is very passionate about serving its clients and providing various solutions in many different areas. It's continuing on fulfilling the nation's missions around the world. So I am just so thankful and grateful to have had the opportunity and to be a veteran today means so very, very much. And also to be an American because there is nothing like our great country. Thank you. Martha, please. I'm Martha Daniel and I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, I was an enlisted uh, seaman in the Navy. <laughs> and I was a typical enlisted. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I just wanted to go see the world. And so the Navy offered that opportunity, I thought, but to see the world ended up being in Winter Harbor, Maine. Not quite, <laughs> not quite the direction I thought I was going. I thought I was going on a ship to Essex, Scotland. But I also knew that I wanted to be a president. I wanted to be something bigger, and I wasn't sure what all of that was going to be. But I knew that the Navy offered me that. I thought so, and so I said I joined. It was good. Okay, let me get out of Memphis and head on to my dreams. And so as a result of that, I, I completed. I was in cryptology. Wasn't sure what that was going to be either. But I did know that it was something good, and it was in technology, and it was something that I thought I would enjoy, and, and, I, and so I did that. And then as a result of that, I, I came out of the Navy, and I received my GI Bill. I went in the military right when they were letting women back into the billet uh, right after the Vietnam War. And so I came out, I, you know, went out, got my graduate degree, got my bachelor's and my graduate degree, and entered into technology. And so as a result of that, uh, I worked for several companies. The IBMs of the world moved up real rapidly. And then a few years later, around after about 15 years of that, kind of said, okay, what do I do next? Became an entrepreneur. So I'm the president and CEO, got there, uh, got me that little president title. And so uh, <laughs> I'm president and CEO of IMRI, <laughs> which is a company that does a lot of defense contracting. I'm a services able veteran, and I'm proud of that, and I'm very proud of some of the things that have happened in our nation as a result to support of the veterans. Uh, but my company does uh, today, we do uh, a defense contracting, we have, uh, cyber security, technology, engineering services, and et cetera. But as I begin to move through that, and it's been 22 years in the business world, and I'm very excited about what we do today, but I, began, I, I, I became president of the Elite Services Saber Veteran Organization, which has 70 chapters. And this chapter, I, you know, I was kind of reluctant in joining a particular chapter. I knew I supported, I always supported, but not to be a president of that. But they needed one in Orange County, and so all of a sudden I went to a meeting, and they made me that. And so... <laughs> 
I said, okay. Well, I have two, per uh, uh, a, a, a gentleman that has two Purple Hearts that encouraged me that, Martha, you can really make a difference in this county. And so what we do is we have uh, uh, several different programs that we support uh, the military that are coming out of service, that are entering into the job market. And so that's a real passion. And we're doing quite a few things to help business owners like myself expand and learn more about business. And also to help our veterans that need to be certified. Oh, boy, has that been something. But anyway, <laughs> getting them certified so that they can do business with the federal government. And so I'm excited about today, and I'm excited about this award because it means a lot to me for what we have to do for other veterans. I'm excited about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Carl? Uh, thank you very much. Um, for most of the people here in the audience, you know what the term the old man me means means you're the commander. Now we have a lot of old ladies in the, uh, in the military service, but I think I'm the old lady here, and I mean that in a different sense. I've heard people um, commissioned from West Point, ROTC. Well, I'm the true volunteer. I entered the service as a direct commission. There was no ROTC open to women, and of course the uh, service academies did not ex um, open their doors to women yet either. I joined the Army on a direct commission because of one person, and that is my husband. My husband and I were in law school together. I met him there. We were married, and he already had a commitment to the Army. He was um, allowed to take off from active duty to go into law school. And um, so while he was in law school, they, the Army uh, career people came to see how he was doing. And he says, uh, I just got married. And they said, oh, congratulations. And then he happened to say, oh, my wife is in law school too. And they said, well, where is she? And he said, she's in torts class. And he, and they, he knocked on the door. The, the judge advocate general knocked on the door of the torts class and said, the Army wants you. So I took a direct commission to the Army as a Judge Advocate General. My husband and I spent um, our first uh, tour of duty in Korea, and then we were sent to Hawaii. I then uh, finished my six years of service, and I stayed in the reserves. In the reserves, I was able to travel around to just about everywhere in the, in the Pacific on exercises and deployments. After, um, uh, well, I, after I left the Army, I was the Deputy Attorney General for the state of Hawaii. Um, then uh, I uh, served as a Senior Attorney for the United States Army uh, Pacific Command at Fort Shafter. And uh, while I was there uh, as a civilian, uh, the uh, surge was taking place in Iraq, and they were looking for civilians to augment the forces in, in Iraq, and I, wrote, I uh, volunteered, and I was one of the first tranche, as they say, the first phase of civilians to go into Iraq, um, not without benefit of the uniform, and I served as the uh, deputy rule of law uh, coordinator for a, uh, the Baghdad provincial reconstruction team. Uh, while I was in the reserves, I worked my way up in the, into the rank, and I um, more or less, it's, it's, it's a second job, so you really have to be able to um, uh, balance things out. But I'm glad I stayed in. I was able to be promoted to Brigadier General. Uh, I was the first woman general in the U.S. Uh, Army Judge Advocate General's Corps. I'm also very proud to have been the first woman general of Asian ancestry to have been promoted to the rank of general in the military. Um, uh, in October of, or I should say in June of 2012, uh, President Obama uh, uh, nominated me and appointed me to the U.S. Court of, of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen. Good morning. My name is Ellen Houlihan. I'm an Army veteran commissioned in the field artillery and served during the Cold War. Professionally, I serve as an Army account executive for the Raytheon Company uh, located in the great state of Texas. <laughs> Today I'm here as a champion of change for the West Point Association of Graduates for which I'm the vice chair of the board of directors. I'm the first woman West Point graduate to be nominated and elected to a leadership position on the board of directors. Specifically, um, the Association of Graduates was formed just after the Civil War, and the organization had seen little change in that over 100 years. 
So I led the team that um, changed the bylaws and the governance model to provide a transparent organization for the over 50,000 members worldwide and also provided for the efficient and effective operation of the organization. I look forward to our continued conversation. Thanks very much. Great. Can we give a round of applause for all of these champions? So thank you, ladies. What I'd like to do now is to ask each one of you to respond to the question in a couple of minutes, which is, how did your military influence, how did the, your military service influence your life? And Graciela, I will start with you. As I listened to the first five women, I thought you all gave extraordinary answers to that. And I heard somebody say the word tenacity, which that's going to be my word for later, by the way. Okay. <laughs> But so I wanted to, to just share a story to answer the question, and um, and here's the story. We had just redeployed from Saudi Arabia, and we'd been home maybe three days when my commander and uh, director of operations called me into the commander's office and tasked me with something. But all I remember was the following sentence: "We want you to do in three and a half weeks what other squadrons usually do in three months." And what that was is go to Red Flag. Uh, how many are familiar with Red Flag exercise at Nellis Air Force Base? Yeah, so it's war fighting games. You take planes and there's you know the good guys and the bad guys and all that. So we were the tankers that were going to go support. And they wanted us to take four tankers to go support in July. So they tasked me with go to the base, find out what we need to do. There's usually a conference and you have three months to prepare, but we're going in three and a half weeks because we've been deployed. So I said, okay, and what that gave me was the confidence and to know that these guys thought that I could go figure all that stuff out and kind of bulldoze my way through whatever obstacles of time existed because it's supposed to be three months. And so that was amazing to me to be tasked with that and go put that together. And so what happened was I figured all that out, I got processed, I've met the right people, I learned who I could influence, I learned who could push the right buttons to make all this happen quickly. And I came back and I said, we're taking an additional jet. And they said, well, no, we've been planning on five. And I said, no, we're taking six, it's July. What if we get there and you know something happens? And you know, So as it worked out, I had to convince a lot of people to take that extra airplane because I just had this feeling that women's intuition. And sure enough, when we landed there, one of our jets had hot brakes and was out of commission. And so had we taken the planned amount, we would have not been able to support the sorties that were planned. So what that taught me and what I use now is I was, I was tasked with something, somebody said uncomfortable. It was pretty uncomfortable. Never had done that before, but I figured it out. And that was the pattern of I can be uncomfortable, I can figure it out, and I have to be tenacious and find the right friends to make it happen. But that's what it taught me. That's, you know, entrepreneurship is very uncomfortable <laughs> when you're yes. starting and figuring it out. But I always go back to those experiences of having that trust, and, um, and now I just trust myself to, to figure it out. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. And Deborah, please share. The question was in reference to what did I learn from the military that have guided me through life right that's influenced your life yes okay well i'll use the word of life mm. when you think of life and living and preparing for the dash the l it taught me to lead to lead people to do the things that need to be done the i is for inspire through leading inspiring them to accomplish the mission that is at hand at all times F is for focus, to stay focused on what is to be accomplished. Understanding the mission, undertaking it, and doing it and serving it. You know, in the Air Force, integrity first, service before self, excellence in all you do. And of course, that E, to excel, to excel no matter what. As I said, in coming from the South, from the 50s, the 60s, going in 70s, and really getting put into the positions, and being able to travel the world and to make a difference. It's one of, even excelling from an educational process, it's a matter of giving back to our youth, especially today. We really need to engage from the perspective of 
veterans of here we are and our communities, let's move forward truly as a nation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Martha. The military taught me uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, don't let nobody turn you around. That was one. And then the second was not to be afraid and intimidated. Uh, it reminded me of, of a little bit of when I started learning how to play golf. Uh, one of the, my golf pro told me, he said, Martha, don't be intimidated by the men out here. They're looking for their ball just like you'll be looking for yours, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's kind of what the military taught me. Yeah. Is that in the male dominant military world, is don't worry about your ball, they're looking for theirs too. So I learned not to be intimidated in cryptology. I mean, I was there was only four women in this whole, in the whole, on the whole base that did what we did. And so I learned that. And so as I moved into my professional career, which is also technology and engineering, and when I got my degree in those two fields and moved out to California where our business operate in, in Elisa Viejo, when I got there and as I moved through my career, I learned the same thing. You know, it really, you just go at it and you show and you do your job and you do what you're supposed to do and you don't be intimidated. So if you know what you know, then you know what you don't know, and you don't have to worry about what you know. So you just go out there and do your thing. And so that's what the military taught me, is to be proud, stand up, be boastful, and just say, hey, I don't have to worry about it. I know I know what I know. Yeah. <laughs> go, Carl, thank you, Martha. Okay, I think uh, uh, the, mil the military taught me three, <laughs> three life skills. One is tolerance. Um, you're exposed to different people, different cultures, different locations, different ideas. And if you don't have tolerance, it's just, it's not going to be a good situation. The second thing is they taught me the life skill is just to roll with the punches. Because if you don't roll with the punches, it's going to be very difficult for you to get along and to get through. And the last thing they taught me is obey. <laughs> Um, if you don't obey, there are consequences. But I mean that in the sense that um, that there's always going to be somebody who is, um, you're not always going to be the last word. There's always going to be somebody you're accountable to, and there'll be times when you're in charge, and there'll be times when you're not in charge. Thank you, Carl. And Ellen? Many of the lessons that you've heard today, both on our panel and the, the first panel, are certainly lessons that I have carried forward in my professional and volunteer life. Um, the one that I would like to bring forward is time management. Um, many years ago when I sat in one of our many uh, briefings as a, as a plebe, a, a freshman at West Point, a Lieutenant Colonel John Solomon, West Point class of 1962, stood up in front of us and said to the plebe class, use your scraps of time. And um, I didn't know exactly, similar to Eric, uh, um, exactly what he meant at, at that time. However, uh, there, are, there are margins of the day and scraps of time every day where you can write a letter, send an email, express thanks to someone who has helped or mentored you, uh, or to start work on the next project. And uh, the, one of the great skills that, that the military taught me was time management. Great. Thank you. And Ellen, I know you just spoke a moment ago, but we're going to turn the, the cycle around here because I'd like the panel to address this next question, which is what action could employers take, service organizations as well as educational institutions, take to make more women veterans successful? Uh, to make more women, uh, I just kind of had this conversation with my boss recently, um, and I said to him in the very, in the nicest way that I could is, Please stay out of my way. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep, that's one. <laughs> uh, and I believe um, Sonia mentioned it. Um, we we understand mission. We understand vision. We understand getting a job done, and we have all been trained to be resourceful and use a great deal of initiative to accomplish a mission. And um, Certainly we understand parameters and, uh, and guidance. We also are all about leadership. And I think having business organizations or volunteer organizations 
look to women veterans for leadership because doggone it, that's one thing that we sure know how to do. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Coral. I think uh, these organizations could probably um, think about bringing more women into their ranks so that these women could be mentors to other women. Um, a lot of times I think we, we, we women don't mentor each other like men mentor each other. So we really need to look at that point where we bring in more women to uh, help the others. And, and I, do, I, I really mean in a mentoring way. Thank you, Carl. Martha. I'm going to speak at it from two different points. From, uh, one is that transitioning. Women coming out of the military. First of all, we need to provide a means. There's shock when they come out. We need to provide a means for child care for sure. It's, it's just, I mean, they, they're used to having child care inside of their, you know, at the bases. But then when they come out, the cost of, that, uh, of child care is exorbitant. The second one we need to do is really look at helping transition properly. I know there's programs out there, but they're not working. When I get a, an, when I get a veteran's resume, the transit, translating that resume across to what the co commercial world wants today is day and night. It's very hard for an HR director to, to read a military resume and translate that to a civilian job. And so what we have to do is begin to, tr to help translate and help the industry hire the vets. They want to, but it's very difficult to help that veteran translate that job into a civilian job as they come out. And that's what I see that organizations can help do better. That's what we can do as organizations that's trying to help our vets. And we're doing that in the services and better organization that I, that I champion. That's exactly the program we have. It's a concierge program that take resumes and translate them into a civilian type resume that would help that veteran get a job. Thank you, Martha. And Deborah. Wow. And thinking of the military, we form family units. It's a big, small, small, big world. And of course, we learn to take care of our own because that's how we are established. And transitioning out, well, as the other three ladies have said and the panel prior to us have stated, it's a thing of really preparing the person. Now you're going to be disjointed from that family and you're entering into a whole new world. So it would be so good if as Martha just was saying from a transitional perspective of really translating that military aspect to a civilian aspect so it will be receptive in the workplace. The bottom line to it is, is that military members are natural uh, leaders, learners, because that's how we are built. That's what it's all about. But coming out and entering into the civilian forces, one really needs to go through a new educational process because civilian life is different from the military life. Thank, Thank you. you, Deborah. Graciela. Oh, this is such a huge question, isn't it? Um, I'm a member of the American GI Forum, which uh, it's National Coalition of Latino Veterans. It was formed after World War II. And they're all about social justice and accessing benefits. That's an important thing I wanted to say that's the right focus. The transitioning, the transitioning question, you know, when I got out, I had completed my master's degree and I had been networking in my community with a lot of business women uh, as part of the Expanding Your Horizons math and science program that mentors um, girls into non-traditional careers. So I had this awesome network already in the community of business women. And when I was transitioning, I would go to the program and I said, oh, they want me to look at some statistics on a website. I'm like, how's that helpful? And so it was the women that were mentoring me that said, well, you actually need to sit down and do an informational interview with such and such. That's what was helpful. And so what I know now as I do the personal branding workshops for veterans at universities is I take the idea of the, the resume, but I help the veteran be loud and proud about their experience and speak in a compelling, memorable way to introduce themselves. Because you really, you need to know how to do that. And uh, personal branding and marketing is not a skill most vets have. That was, thankfully, what, that was my master's degree. So I feel like I had all the right skills from networking already in the community years before I even needed any of that to getting the marketing experience so that I would know how to take not everything I'd ever done, but the few skills that mattered to this potential employer to get that interviewer. Uh, interview because too many vets are told to put together a resume and they put everything on there. 
And it's not about everything, it's about what are you applying for? And that is a marketing skill. What message do I have for this particular audience? And so I think that the programs uh, are failing short in really equipping veterans for the real business world. And we need people who are in the business world reaching in way before they're leaving to, to coach them out. If we wait till they're out, that's where all the depression, the loss of self-worth sets in, and all the consequences of that. And so that's really how I see it is, is we cannot wait until you're out, until you're already a veteran. You've got to go way before that. And I don't know how we do that because, you know, do we want corporations recruiting from our active duty ranks actively? I don't know. But that's what the veterans need. So that's my answer. Great. Thank you, Graciela. So we have one more question, and it's uh, this last one that we'd ask you to think about, which is, what one word would you use to describe a value or principle that guides you? And Graciela, I'm going to start with you. As I said earlier, it has to be tenacity because the, the commonality that I hear with all of us. And uh, we just started a, a National Women Veteran Speakers Bureau to bring women like us together. And we're focusing on women who have published. It's the stories of how absolutely tenacious we are that we just, you can't stop us. You can't, uh, you can't defeat somebody who won't give up. That tenacity, that is the guiding principle that, uh, that I live by. Thank you. Deborah. I would say attitude. With the attitude of I can do it, yes you can. Thank you. Thank you. I would say guts. <laughs> and I define guts as being not being greedy, uh, having unity, working, you didn't get there alone, no one is an island. T for trustworthiness, D say what you mean, mean what you say. And the last one I, because I'm an ordained minister of the United Methodist, uh, African Methodist Episcopal, Ch Episcopal Church, is have spiritual, spirituality. There is a God and there is someone that would always be there when others will not be there for you. I'd like to say humor, <laughs> because if you can't go to bed at night with a smile on your face, then what was the day about? I love it. Um, and Ellen. Uh, all great, uh, great watchwords. Uh, the word that I would use is love. There's a quotation that's credited to Mother Teresa, and it goes something like this. We can accomplish no great things, but we can accomplish small things with great love. And I believe that um, all of us, whether it's through mentoring, whether it's reaching out to other, um, others in your community, uh, you can do that with great love. And it's, it's as simple as saying, hello, how are you? Thank you for your service. Please tell me about it. Great, thank you all. Can we give the champions a round of applause? I love the guests.